just figured I ought to wear my old NASA flight jacket, which I'm glad to say still fits. But even so, given my uh, thinning hair up here, I may not look like your traditional picture of an astronaut. So I figured, you know, you're just going to have to believe me that the, the guy up there in the red stripes uh, is me. And uh, that is the Hubble Space Telescope. And th that was the mission in December of 1993, where we fixed the optics. Uh, most of you probably remember the disaster when it went up and turned Hubble into what finally has become NASA's really most uh, productive science mission ever. This was actually my fourth space flight, and it was 15 years after I first showed up at the Johnson Space Center in Houston in July of 1978 as one of 35 what we called ourselves the TFNG, 35 new guys. We were the uh, first astronauts selected. Yeah, I had a beard back then. And that didn't last long. You have to wear an oxygen mask flying the T-38s. But uh, And then I, I shaved off everything but my mustache. And then when the last black hair turned white, my wife said, lose the mustache. And I, <laughs> I always do everything that she says, so there we go. Anyway, when we showed up as new astronauts, um, a lot of people really didn't know that much about the space program, and NASA wanted us to appreciate what had come before. So they got a lot of the older astronauts, uh, both who were still working, and they brought some in from the outside to tell us about the early space program. So for instance, we heard about the Mercury program from uh, Alan Shepard. Um, Alan, actually, just a little story about him. He had retired from NASA already, and, and he was running the Coors Beer distributorship in the Houston area. So, of course, he supplied all of the uh, beer for the astronaut parties, except in one party, the, the guy who organized it, he must have been totally clueless because he ordered a keg of Budweiser, and boy, did he get hell from Alan. But anyway, um, and then we heard about the uh, Gemini program from John Young, who uh, went on. He had two flights on Gemini, two flights on Apollo, walked on the moon on Apollo 16, commanded the first shuttle flight, um, and he was the head of the astronaut office for most of the time that I was there. Uh, of course, we all wanted to meet Neil Armstrong, uh, and uh, NASA did invite him to come and talk to us about Apollo 11. Sort of typical of what Neil's life was like, twice, two times during the probably one hour and a half that he talked to us, a secretary came running in, you know, there's an urgent phone call that you have to make, and, and I mean, it was just uh, the, the poor guy. He actually, after Apollo 11, um, he went to NASA headquarters and became the associate administrator for aeronautics and was doing a great job. And, and had he been able to continue at it, he really could have made a, a positive impact on, really, it's, it's a perennially understood and underfunded part of NASA, the first A, the aeronautics part of NASA. However, one of the aspects of, of being an astronaut, uh, and this applies to all of us, is that you get, quote, volunteered uh, to fulfill appearance requests from Congress. Um, now, of course, in the astronaut office, there's lots of us, and so it gets spread around, and you don't get hit that often. But now, here, Neil Armstrong, not just an astronaut, but Neil Armstrong, and he's a NASA employee, and he's right around the corner from Congress. Uh, the problem is NASA can't refuse requests from Congress when they want astronauts, because Congress pays the bills. And so, unfortunately, and of course, as a NASA employee, Neil had to comply when the NASA administrator accepted the invitations. And, and in the end, unfortunately, he just felt that he couldn't really accomplish in his job what he wanted to do. And he left NASA, moved to a farm in rural Ohio, his home state, and became a professor at the University of Cincinnati, which actually surprised a lot of people. Uh, you know, they thought it was kind of strange considering, you know, there's the first person to walk on the moon. Think of all the, the things he could have done, all the money he could have made. But no, he was, uh, that suited his personality. And, and by all reports, he was an excellent professor. He could explain complex topics in, in aerodynamics and in understandable terms. 
And this is an ability that actually many of his fellow astronauts uh, commented on. This is a picture of Neil in his uh, NASA headquarters uh, suit and tie, which is very different from what he wore as a test pilot at Edwards and, and as an astronaut in, in Houston. But that's uh, NASA headquarters. But in any case, his ability to explain things um, is, is something that many of his fellow astronauts commented on. Um, Dave Scott flew on Gemini 8 with uh, Neil, and that was the first true rendezvous and docking in space. And you'll see graphically in the film uh, the problems that they ran into after they docked with the uh, Gina the thruster failed open and started them spinning out of control, and it's pretty realistic. Um, but anyway, here's what Dave Scott said about Neil. Many people, including the engineers at McDonnell Douglas, had difficulty understanding exactly how the rendezvous would work. There were no textbooks on rendezvous. This was breaking new ground. Neil soon put the engineers straight, though. He had an amazing capacity for assimilating and then explaining the most complex subjects in a very straightforward way, but with a soft, understated touch. I used to call it his professorial mode. I remember he once stood up in front of a blackboard in St. Louis as we were discussing the rendezvous, and he said, wait a minute, guys, here's how it's done. He then proceeded to set out the various phases of the profile in the simplest terms possible. It was excellent. It's as though he had been teaching the subject for years and years. Well, actually, in the movie, the, the professorial mo uh, part of Neil's personality is actually hard to convey on film. Uh, you will see how he did spend a lot of time studying and writing notes, which all of us professors have to do all the time. Everybody asks, what was Neil like as a person? Um, I, I can't really make any claim to have known him well in, in a personal sense. But uh, luckily, in addition to that initial talk that he gave to us as, as rookie astronauts, uh, I was lucky enough to be able to meet him and talk with him on several occasions during astronaut reunions. He was always very obliging, and at one point he was kind enough to send, to send my youngest son a congratulatory letter on receiving his uh, Eagle Scout award. And uh, the most recent encounter was in 2009, during the 40th anniversary of Apollo 11, uh, 10 years ago, this was a, a big celebration that our Department of uh, Aeronautics and Astronautics put on at MIT, and both Neil and Buzz were there, and it's also my uh, colleague, Professor Larry Young, who's trying to hitch a ride, unsuccessfully, <laughs> obviously, but uh, Anyway, when you're looking at the movie, it, it's basically about Neil, but his family does play an important role, as do a few other astronauts. Buzz Aldrin plays a small role. He had to be in it, obviously. He flew with Neil. You'll hardly see anything about Mike Collins, and if you stay when the movie is over and watch the credits, you'll notice that uh, there are a lot of names of real astronauts, but in the movie, they're, they're hardly ever mentioned by names, and most of them were never mentioned by names. When you're looking at a biopic, a, a movie about someone's life, uh, the images on film are so strong that you have to be careful to uh, treat, it, it, you can't just treat the film as history. Um, because it's, you know, it's, it's a movie and they have to make changes. Um, as an example, uh, Neil commented on Tom Wolfe's book, The Right Stuff, and I took this quote and others as well. When I found out I was going to be giving this talk, I figured, well, I better go and read the book, First Man, by Jim Hansen, because the movie was based on that, and there's a lot more detail there. Here's what uh, Neil said about the right stuff, and of course that's the Bell X-1 where Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier. He said, I haven't read the book, but I did see the movie. I thought it was very good filmmaking, but it was terrible history. It had the wrong people working on the wrong projects at the wrong time, and it bears no resemblance whatever to what was actually going on. That's pretty strong. Um, <laughs> So what about this movie? Well, uh, Neil's first wife, Janet, is, I think she's beautifully portrayed in, in this movie, by the way, but she was married to Neil for many years and apparently hoped that their relationship, which you'll get a good sense of, uh, would eventually improve when he left NASA, and actually that apparently didn't happen, and she eventually left him and they divorced. 
Uh, Neil was very upset uh, when that happened, but fortunately he, uh, he did find and he married another woman whose emotional disposition apparently was, was better suited to his, and apparently they were very happy together. And Jan Armstrong died just last year, but she was consulted frequently during the making of the film, as were Neil and her two sons, Mark and, and Rick. Um, and, and all of them said they were pretty happy with the movie, so hopefully the image that we get of Neil in this movie, I mean, Ryan Gosling really creates a character, and hopefully it's, it's not uh, too far from reality of, of what Neil was really like. Uh, another way of, of learning something about what he was like is to listen to comments by his astronaut colleagues. And, and by the way, I say colleagues rather than close friends because he was not a person who had very many close friends. He was hard to get close to Neil, uh, even for the people he flew with. Uh, Jim Hansen, who wrote the book, uh, gives the following description of the relationship that Neil and Buzz and Mike had on Apollo 11. He called them amiable strangers. Um, and when they, they talked a lot, of course, but they talked about technical things. And uh, in technical matters, of course, Neil was superb. For most test pilots, uh, you would say they're pilots first, and yeah, they've learned a little bit about engineering because they had to, to be test pilots, but not Neil. Uh, Neil, you can't say whether for him being a pilot or an engineer came first. Uh, for him, they were both part and parcel of the same thing. And almost anyone who ever rated Armstrong as a pilot makes a connection between his piloting skills and his engineering background and talents. Uh, there, was, there was another quote from a colleague at the Flight Research Center who wrote, Neil was the most technically capable of the early X-15 pilots and the most intelligent of all the X-15 pilots in a technical sense. So here's a, another passage from, uh, from the book. Armstrong's peers respected Neil's abilities as a pilot, an engineer, and an astronaut. They admired his intelligence, and they wondered at his unique personality uh, traits. Uh, Dave Scott, again, who flew with Neil on Gemini 8, said, uh, the guy was really cool, cool, calm, and energized. He was very easy to work with. He was a very smart guy. He could make an analysis of a problem very quickly. The guy was really cool under pressure. Frank Borman's comments. My first impression of Neil was that he was quiet. Because he was so quiet and so thoughtful, when he said something, it was worth listening to. Most of us pilots were, hey, we're operational, we're let's get it done people. Now, of course, Neil was operationally oriented too, but he'd be more interested in trying to understand exactly what the inner mechanisms of the system were. Most of us pilots came out of the same mold. But Neil, he was different. And then Mike Collins. Neil was a very reserved individual. He presented a certain facade, a certain persona. I think he was more thoughtful than the average test pilot. To call Armstrong shy, though, can be misleading. I think he was quite happy with his own persona. It wasn't so much that he was unable to share his feelings with other people. It was more that he was unwilling or just not interested to share with other people. And of course, that could be con interpreted as uh, shyness. You're going to see a scene in the movie uh, where Neil ejects from the lunar landing training vehicle. He was a superb test pilot, as well as an engineer, of course. This vehicle was, well, I could talk a long time about it, but it, it was a very unstable vehicle. Um, it crashed several, they, they had several crashes. They built three of them, and two of them were destroyed. Um, but here's how Neil described the incident, <clears throat> very test pilot type talk. In the final 100 feet of descent going into landing, I noticed, noted that my control was degrading. Quickly, control was non-existent. The vehicle began to turn. We had no secondary control system that we could energize, no emergency system with which we could recover control. So it became obvious as the vehicle reached 30 degrees of bank that I wasn't going to be able to stop it. I had a very limited time left to escape the vehicle, so I ejected. Limited time. He actually had one quarter of a second to make that decision. <laughs> Any later and he would have, well, the parachute wouldn't have had time to open or, or perhaps even worse. Actually, Buzz Aldrin talked about the, uh, the incident. 
um, trying to explain why he waited so long to eject. And what Buzz said, well, Neil was a test pilot, so he held on as long as he could. He didn't want to abandon an expensive piece of hardware. Only at the last possible moment, he pulled his ejection handles, and he had only a fraction of a second left. If the trainer had tipped too far over and he had fired his ejection seat just a little later, the rocket charge would have propelled him headfirst into the concrete below. So think of that, and I, I hope that gives you an idea why the decision was made that all of the early astronauts should be military test pilots. Or, well, actually, Armstrong by that time was a civilian, but he had been in the military. He was in the Korean War, and he was a civilian test pilot. But in any case, the point is, space flight is an inherently dangerous environment, it, even more so than aviation. It is totally intolerant of mechanical failures or human errors. Uh, Armstrong said about risk, I always felt that the risks we had in the space program were probably less than we had back when I was a, a test pilot at Edwards. And to give you an idea what he was talking about, in the year 1952, out at Edwards Air Force Base in the test pilot community, 62 test pilots died in the space of 36 weeks. Lots of smoke and holes in the ground. That's nearly two pilots a week. So the thing you have to realize is that Neil, as well as all of his other astronaut colleagues who had come from this uh, test pilot community, they had lived with death their entire working lives. Neil's attitude towards death. Well, as for the chance of dying, it's a reality that you live with. And I guess you think the odds are with you if you keep your head and don't do anything foolish. That's the key word, don't do anything foolish, because that's the feeling behind the traditional test pilot's prayer, which was later adopted by the astronauts. Dear God, please don't let me screw up. <laughs> it's the truth. Anyway, I've been talking about Neil, uh, and I want to say a little bit about the film itself. Um, as I mentioned before, you have to be a little bit careful when you're looking at, about, at a film not to confuse it with uh, true history. However, um, I, I will say the makers of this film went to extraordinary measures to keep it as close to reality as possible. There are a few instances, however, where cinematographic uh, concerns took precedence over reality. For instance, uh, the very first scene of the movie, very dramatic, you'll see Neil having problems flying his plane. He's bouncing off the Earth's atmosphere in a, a rocket plane. Again, the X-15. Well, this actually happened. Um, Neil had come back, because they were flying up above the atmosphere, most of the atmosphere here, and when he came back into the thick part of the atmosphere, he came in at too shallow an angle, so he bounced off. And when he re-entered a second time, he was already off over Los Angeles, way too far to the south, and he had to make a 180 degree turn over Los Angeles and just barely made it back to Edwards. But all of this happened really, really high up, way above the clouds. When you look at the scene in the movie, you'll see him flying through the clouds. And the reason was you need the clouds going by to give you that sense of speed. Because in a high altitude airplane or in a spacecraft, for example, I mean, you have no idea of how fast you're going because there's no wind noise, there's no vibration, there's no, you know, billboards or clouds rushing by the window. So. Um, and the other thing, you'll see the plane shaking a lot, which at lower altitudes it would have done, but up high it wouldn't have. But again, it's much more dramatic when you're shaking around. So, And then there's another very emotional scene where uh, just before Neil leaves home for his uh, journey to the moon, uh, where his wife, Jan, uh, made him tell his sons of the dangers that he was going to face. Now, Neil's son, Rick, said afterwards he did not in, as he does in the movie, he did not ask his dad if he was going to come back. Neil actually volunteered that information on his own. But when they shot the scene a couple of different ways, it, it seemed to go better when Rick asked the question, and so that's what ended up in the movie. Finally, um, in the film, Neil leaves a bracelet on the moon that belonged to his deceased daughter, Karen, who had died of, a, of cancer uh, when she was only a little over two years old. When he was doing the research for the book, uh, 
Jim Hansen apparently asked Neil whether he left something on the moon, and Neil said no. But for whatever reason, Jim Hansen did not believe him. And then he went, Jim Hansen went and asked Neil's sister. And all his sister could say was, well, I don't know, but I sure hope so. What Neil himself said during a press conference shortly before the launch of Apollo 11, and this is pure Neil Armstrong, uh, he was asked if he was going to take any personal mementos to the moon with him. And Neil's answer was, well, if I had a choice of taking something extra, I'd take more fuel. <laughs> there we go. Anyway, as I say, that's pure Neil Armstrong, so you can decide for yourself. Uh, everybody, you know, what was he really like? What's his personality? You know, maybe it's not so important in the long run because what he's really going to be remembered for, as we all know, is that he was the first man to take that step on the surface of another planetary body. So, towards the end, uh, I, I want to try to give you a, a little sense of, of how he felt about taking the first step on the moon. The truth, frankly, is that he didn't really think much about it. He put all of his effort into making a successful landing. That's where he had to use all of his skill as a pilot and an engineer. The final approach and landing scene in the movie is, is pretty realistic, where you know, he had, had to override the computer-selected landing spot, flying over a boulder field until he could find a safe place to land while alarms were going off. And by the way, you'll, you'll see that in, in the movie. The alarms, the mission control knew what the alarms were all about. They had simulated this just a couple of days before the launch, but by that time, the crew was in Florida and nobody told them about it. So Neil and Buzz didn't know what was coming, but you know they kept their cool. Um, being the first man to walk on the moon, however, that was easy. Um, you know, Neil, the thing that he worried about was, was really the final descent to the moon landing, because that's where there were so many unknowns. Um, his words were, stepping down the ladder and walking around on the surface, oh, on a 10-point scale, I consider that a one. <laughs> the lunar descent and landing on the same 10-point scale well, that was probably a 13. <laughs> so I'm going to end now on a little philosophical note. And I should say, few people ever accused Neil of being a philosopher. But you can imagine, in his position, he was asked almost continuously to reflect on the meaning of the moon landing. And so before we watch the movie, let's, for a moment, get away from Neil as a superb test pilot and engineer and give him a chance to express his thoughts about the significance of the moon landing. Jam Armstrong, his wife, first wife, related, Neil was always being asked these questions. He was never comfortable speaking about non-technical things, but he recognized his responsibility, and he did it, and he did a great job of it. And so here are Neil's own words. I think we're going to the moon because it's in the nature of human beings to face challenges. It's the nature of our deep inner souls. We're required to do these things, just as salmon swim upstream. Hopefully, the trips we'll be making in the next couple of decades will open up our eyes a little. When you look at the Earth from the lunar distance, its atmosphere is unobservable. And I can add at this point that uh, even from the shuttle's altitude of a few hundred miles, which is not nearly as far as they went to the moon. But still, you know, look up there. You can just see that very thin blue line on the horizon, and that's all you see of the Earth's atmosphere. So let's go back to Neil's words. The atmosphere is so thin. That should impress everyone. The atmosphere of the Earth is a small and valuable resource. We're going to have to learn how to conserve it and use it wisely. Down here on the ground, you're inside the atmosphere, and it seems large, adequate, and so you don't worry about it too much. But from a different vantage point from space, perhaps it's possible to understand more easily why we should be worrying about it. And I have to remind you, the first Earth Day 
beginning of the environmental movement and all that, wasn't until April of 1970. Neil's words were spoken long before the depletion of the ozone layer or the green, global warming caused by greenhouse gases that became uh, newsworthy. So, Neil Armstrong appears not only to be an excellent pilot, an engineer, an astronaut, but when the situation demanded it, he could be a scientist and a philosopher as well. So, uh, I was very fortunate. I did meet Neil, even although only just for a few brief encounters, and now he's no longer with us, but he'll forever be remembered as the first man. And I hope I've maybe given you a little insight into what Neil was like, over and above what you'll see in the movie. So now, time to enjoy this cinematic reflection on Neil Armstrong, the first human being to leave the Earth and walk on the moon. The first man. Thank you.